Bangarang to fellow Lost Boys, Mermaids, and Pirates, let's celebrate the 25th anniversary of Hook with two special guests who are part of the Banning family. Hi, my name is Caroline Goodall, and I played Moira Banning, and um, I am just thrilled to be here. Thank you. And I'm Charlie Corsmo. I played Jack Banning, uh, Caroline's son in the film. It's it's crazy because I, I've never been able to find anything where I got to see the entire Banning family actually sit down for an interview. And one of my first questions, my initial question, would be with the audition process, because I've heard from several other cast members that Steven Spielberg usually has people come in and just talk to him as opposed to just reading lines but I didn't know for sure because particularly this is about a family I didn't know for sure if you guys had to come in for chemistry tests so how did that initial process work before before filming began who wants uh, to take this first I'll, I'll start uh, so I, 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 I don't remember the entire process frankly but I do remember my first uh, audition uh, audition for the uh, for the movie and, and you're right it was uh, very much as you described uh, uh, Stephen, I guess you know, via my agent, uh, invited me to uh, to audition for the uh, for the part, uh, and I came in, and it was uh, Stephen, it was uh, Robin Williams, uh, and it was, uh, and I'm not entirely sure why, it was also Carrie Fisher uh, was at my audition for the, for uh, for the movie, and she she came up to me and said, "Hi, I'm Carrie." Uh, Princess Leia. I said, yeah, I, I know we are. <laughs> no problem uh, recognizing you. Uh, but uh, uh, but it was very much as you uh, you described. We uh, we spent almost the entire audition doing uh, almost improv games. Uh, mostly me and uh, me and Robin, uh, where we were doing. We did did a couple readings from the uh, from the actual script, and then. Uh, Stephen would just uh, sort of invent scenarios for Robin and I to play around with. So it was, I spent the afternoon getting to play improv games with Robin Williams, which was a, a nice way to spend the afternoon. Oh, great. Yeah, well, actually, uh, oh, Charlie, that is so cool. Um, I think the answer with um, Princess Leia was she ended up doing, I think, a lot of the dialogue um, uh, as well, because they had some other people writing, and I heard that Carrie Fisher was doing some of the dialogue. So it was either that, or they w were thinking of her for your mom, and <laughs> there you go. just decided they didn't want her English accent. You, she, exactly. she you beat her out for the role. Accent. That's good. She went to Rada, I think, and she actually had a superb English uh, uh, English accent. Anyway, I, I'm. I'm glad to know that, uh, you know, I knew of one rival, um, which was Emma Thompson, uh, but that was the only one. I think I'm, I'm extremely, you know, R.A.P., God bless her soul. Um, it would have been rather fun to know that um, Carrie was also in the running. Um, yes, uh, I actually had the most amazing uh, audition because I had seen Stephen for it and I really just fell in love with him. I just thought he was the easiest person in the world. I couldn't believe that such a fantastic, fantastically um, successful film director could just be kind of just so relaxed um, and chatty. And so we had a great time. You reminded me of one of my uncles. And then I really thought nothing about it because I didn't hear anything. And I was packing to go back to London for Christmas and I get a call from my agent saying, do you think you could cancel or, you know, change your flight? And I said, no. I said, it's not one of those you know, changeable ones, I'll lose all my money, why, what's up? And he said, well, Steven Spielberg would really love to see you with Robin Williams. And I went, oh, I think I could probably do, I think I could probably yes, do. Let, let me call my travel agent. Oh my God, and the night before I'd been out with friends, and, and, and so I said, like, when? And he said, well, God, if you could come in this afternoon, that would be fantastic. I said, what? And I, I actually had a slight hangover. And I, I, was, I can report I did not have a hangover at my audition. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so anyway, I just threw on something and I kind of literally, you know, dragged a comb through my hair and I just thought, oh, well, whatever. And I went charging down and I got in there and I found that I was alone with Robin Williams and Steven Spielberg and an old kind of Sony cam. Um, which Stephen was fiddling with and decided to point at us. And um, long and short of it, they said, well, look, you know, how are you at improv? Now, ironically, I had actually been a stand-up comedian, which nobody knew about, because uh, since then I've been doing a lot of, you know, Shakespeare and, you know, sort of serious roles. Uh, but actually it was one of my favorite things is to improv. Um, 
And I said, oh, I don't know. Sure, try me out. So they gave me some kind of scenario. So I start babbling away. And about halfway through, I turned to Robin and I said, you're not saying anything. And he just smiled and that beautiful kind of Robin, you know, nanu nanu kind of smile um, and said, ah, but I've got the job. <laughs> you know, and I just thought, I'm just going to enjoy this. I was two of the greatest geniuses in the world. This is this is what Hollywood is about. I've only been here three months. Um, you know, if nothing ever comes of this, I don't care. I've just had one of the best experiences. This is what acting's about. Um, this is this is a Hollywood experience. So anyway, we you know finished, and I walked out. And you know how you're kind of always in that sort of strange space when you do those things. You kind of it's almost out of body. Um, and um, the pair of them came out of the uh, room while I'm sort of fumbling for my keys and, and sweating and, and all of that, you know, suddenly started shaking. And they just looked at me and they said, you've got the job, we want you to play the part. And it is so rare, and it's never happened to me since, that a director has come out and had the respect for an artist and the understanding that you are going to go home and you're going to be wondering what happened. And he had the power to just say, right, you've got the job. So I went home knowing immediately after the audition that I had the job. I was completely gobsmacked. And then it was the days of answering machines. I rang absolutely everyone I knew and I got everyone's answering machine. <laughs> and I'm walking around my small apartment going, oh my God, there's no one to tell. You know, there's no one to share this with. I just left messages on machines. And then finally people started ringing me and that was the beginning of, you know, the greatest adventure. And, and what was your first encounter with one another? Because I would only assume that they kind of wanted you guys to have a family sense before they started shooting, that you, you really were a family. Well, I'm um, interested to hear what your recollection of this is because I'll, I'll, I'll give mine, but obviously it's... Uh, my uh, recollection is... God, I can't even remember us meeting until we got on set, to be honest. Uh, we did not. I, I, mean, I was a late hire on this thing, and I, I don't know why that was exactly, uh, but I got hired after they had already begun filming, and so I came sort of rushing out to Los Angeles uh, uh, to shoot, and the first scene I was on set for uh, was the one where it's the big banquet honoring him at his company. And you're in the crowd uh, applauding for him. And I, I met you. Uh, I met you that day, but we did not get, uh, uh, you know, a long sort of bonding process before the movie started. Not at all. None of us actually. I think I met Amber a little before um, because I remember her mother very well. As um, do I. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think. But Charlie, you had a little bit of a kind of movie star reputation already. <laughs> <laughs> that seems hard to believe. I, I think it's enhanced when you get to waltz in at the last second. But yeah, <laughs> no, but it was. I think it was. Do you think you know? It was like, well, we're real. I mean, I even remember Stephen. I have a funny feeling talking about this because, of course, so much is done with movies to do with scheduling. Of course, so the although actually the first, yeah, we were all the family were early on, weren't we? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I think I heard something like, well, we've been really trying to get this kid. His name is Charlie Cosmo. He's just a genius. Um, and we just don't know if we can get him. Um, and so we're just trying really hard. And then you turn up and, you know, the genius Charlie Cosmo turned up. And you know, your <laughs> reputation has come before you. This is, And Stephen adored Charlie. Oh, my God, he loved him. He loved you so much. You could do no wrong. <laughs> That's, that's nice to hear. I loved Stephen too. We, we, I, I feel like we did have a wonderful uh, uh, relationship, both he and I, and 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 Robin and I, uh, where it, it was like we'd known each other our whole lives. I feel like I, I don't know why, but I feel like I reminded both of them of uh, what they were like as kids, uh, yeah, uh, and we really had a, a bonding experience. Yeah, I think you did because you were so smart. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, obviously, that they wanted you as well is because, you know, of course they were looking for the younger them. Uh, you know, in a way, that's what the whole movie was about. Well, you know, it's Peter Pan and, you know, all three of, you know, including um, uh, Hoffman, of course, all admitted that they were complete Peter Pans. Uh, <laughs> and it was one of the reasons why they wanted to make the film. 
um, and uh, you know for obviously other reasons as well but um, that was one so uh, yeah and I mean it was really lovely to witness the relationships that you forged with them um, as well um, and uh, you know I, I think it really was it felt so relaxed such a family atmosphere um, and I was totally spoiled for the rest of my career because this was my first real um, experience of, um, you know, Hollywood film. And I thought they were all like that. You know, I thought they were all going to be $100 million films going for six months or more with hundreds of people and just fabulous time. <laughs> Well, it was the last movie, I, last movie like that I ever did. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, so there you go. You know, I read a lot about how the film was very much criticized before it even came out. When you guys were on set, did you hear anything outside um, in the Hollywood world how they were kind of like criticizing the film initially, Charlie? Well, frankly, well, actually, I mean, just to go back, I mean, they, I, it actually has some parallels to The Wizard of Oz in that respect. Uh, the Wizard of Oz was not uh, uh, some smash hit when it uh, when it first came out either, and obviously Hook, Hook uh, you know, did well business-wise. Uh, maybe not what uh, uh, what people were hoping for, but uh, uh, but uh, I agree, it's one that's uh, reputation. I think is going to grow uh, grow with time, uh, much like Wizard of Oz. Uh, in terms of what I, you know, what I saw at the time, uh, you know, I don't think I was as plugged in to uh, uh, sort of the, the critics. I mean, I did have a sense that it was viewed as a bit of a disappointment when the uh, when it came out, and that there was a lot of pressure on Stephen uh, uh, when it was being made. I mean, the only time I remember it really seeping through is when we were filming sort of the finale, where the crocodile uh, uh, comes alive and falls on uh, uh, falls on Dustin, <laughs> Dustin uh, Captain Hook, uh, and they had all these problems with this mechanical crocodile. Uh, yeah. And the ne the next movie Stephen was going to make was Jurassic Park. Uh, and he was sitting there with his head in, head in his hands uh, yeah. saying, I don't know how we're going to do the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park <laughs> if this is the best we can do here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't know. I, I would think, uh, Carolyn, you probably were a little more plugged into what the, uh, uh, what the buzz was. Well, uh, yeah, I was slightly older than you. <laughs> a little. A little. Yeah. It gets less with you with time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, is that the buzz was this is the first hundred million dollar movie ever. The well, second, anytime you're spending that much money, right, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the brickbats come out. Yeah, the second was it was Sony Studios' first film. They just bought Columbia. So it was it, very, very important for the Japanese and for Sony that this would be deemed a huge hit because it was the first Japanese foray into Hollywood. So I think um, also there was a sort of underlying attempt from the kind of Hollywood elite, as it were, who hated the idea that, that uh, exterior investment in such a big way was coming in, uh, you know, and that they'd actually bought a studios and changed the name to Sony. Um, and that, you know, perhaps Stephen, who had always been um, affiliated with Universal, was doing a work for hire and, you know, was betraying them. Um, and I think that might have had something to do with it. Um, uh, however, ironically, what I do remember was the hype was enormous in terms of people coming down and seeing the sets because yeah, the sets, everyone in Hollywood came to, yeah, came to see that set. Sets by Napier were just extraordinary. Um, and, you know, he'd done Cats, Les Mis, all of that. He's a, you know, wonderful British um, theatre designer as well as film. Um, so we would get all these people, these dignitaries would come down. It was kind of like, you know, part of the sort of VIP sightseeing tour of Los Angeles in, you know, was it 1990 or something? And uh, I used to go down and hang because, you know, I had a lot of time off, obviously, because this, you know, went on forever and I wasn't in, in Neverland, but I just wanted to learn. And this was the greatest masterclass in filmmaking that I could ever have. So, and it was so much fun. You know, I, you know, I hung out the props sometimes and, you know, occasionally I'd stand in, uh, 
green screen for Julia Roberts, who wasn't around. So I played Tinkerbell's voice. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, <laughs> I'll just ask Caroline, she'll do it. <laughs> and one of the things Stephen would ask me to do take the kind of assembled dignitaries around the set too so I was like an unofficial tour guide um, and I remember taking John Voigt around who um, uh, not with Angelina Jolie but with his son and he wrote me the most adorable note saying thank you um, and we in the end there was gift uh, a sort of guest book um, that people would sign and it was one of our gifts i don't know if you still have it charlie i do yeah yeah that they they gave us the guest book of all the people who'd come down and all the comments that people had written uh after they'd seen the sets and hung out with us uh so it was kind of a really amazing glorious time so the idea of it you know I, you know, who cares whether it did well or not? Yeah, I um, think there was some pressure on the uh, side. So thinking back, I remember a sort of mordant joke that uh, Robin Williams told while we were in the midst of some bombastic scene. He said, yes, brought, brought to you from the people who brought you the movie magic of uh, 1941, Popeye and Ishtar. Yes. <laughs> oh. As they were detailing all their disasters. That's, 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 that's right. So I think there was some fear this was going to get lumped in with those, but I, I don't think it did. Yeah, Hook is actually, um, after all these years, more successful officially than E.T. Uh, so, and I think all those things that the critics didn't like about it, which was this sort of united colors of Benetton, Lost Boys, and the Americanization of it, uh, I think in a way he was slightly ahead of his time because that, you know, sort of became, you know, kind of irrelevant a few years later. Um, I think it was in a way one of the most global American films um, that we can think of. And everything now is geared towards globalism and towards universal audiences. And I do remember in the early 90s, you know, if you look at American you know, American international films, you know, America was about 70% of the world market and the world was 30%. Now that's just been turned on, it's on, it's turned on its head now. And the world market is about 72% and um, the US domestic market is the rest. So that is why most tentpole films now are marketed to international audiences. And I think um, probably Hook, um, they were very careful actually about their marketing. They knew that the um, rest of the world was going to be a very big market and that America was only a part of it and they could see see how things were changing. I read something along the lines of that it was originally going to be a musical. So do you guys yeah. remember having a script with actual lyrics and with I songs that you guys were going to perform? Oh, uh, we sang, I recorded that song. Um, with John Williams, can you believe it, as the conductor and a whole orchestra. And I can hardly sing to save my life. And I Maggie, find, that, I find that hard to believe, listening Me to you. Me too. <laughs> did you sing, Charlie? I did, I did not. I, I don't remember anything of this other than that, uh, obviously, uh, Amber had a song. That's right. Well, that song was um, written for I think all the women to sing, because I know Maggie had to sing it and I had to sing it and she had to sing it. But there was also the songs that the pirates were singing. It was definitely musical. And I think they're actually still thinking of wondering whether they should turn it into a stage musical again as well, because I know that uh, Jim Hart mentioned it. Um, and those songs are still there, but I, then I, I obviously they just decided not to. They had a lot of music in the film. Um, and of course that one song that she sang uh, that they kept in and I rather feel I rather wonder if Stephen decided to keep it in just because he just didn't want Amber to be upset <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember her relentlessly practicing it in the school trailer, so I can't I can't listen to that song anymore Oh my god, and she was just so adorable But listen, I want to hear about you and the Lost Boys and all the kids on the set as well and that whole world That you were immersed in for a month well, it's funny though, actually. I mean, you mentioned that you weren't in the the Lost Boys scenes. Well, neither was I. So I, I feel like uh, I've uh, 
uh, I, I wasn't really a part of that either. In fact, I, you know, I went home for a month back to, I lived in Minnesota at the time, and I went, went home for a month while they were filming all the, all the Lost Boys Neverland sequences. So I, I feel like I kind of missed, missed out on that, uh, that part as well. Well, it's, it's said that there were a lot of scenes cut with you, Dustin, and Bob. A couple of them that I have listed here are that you got to play with the pirates a lot more than we see in the film. So you train with them. There's a horse race in the pirate town. You get to shoot your own camp. Cannon. There's a lifeboat and a fake storm, and also Dustin had a song called "Stick with Me," and apparently he yes, did film some of that. Do you remember this? I remember that song. Yes. We did. Fi- yeah, I remember filming all the stuff with the uh, the antics with the pirates. And in fact, that was my audition scene was me ordering training Robin as a pilot, uh, or as a pirate, uh, ordering him uh, uh, around. And yeah, we filmed a lot of that stuff. And I, you know, the movie was more than two hours long <laughs> and anyway so it's a little long for a family film it would have been three and a half hours if we'd kept in all the pirate stuff because there's all those little kind of sort of flashback scenes and bits and pieces and you know you have to kind of you know have a day where you're you know it's a bit like that movie green card where they suddenly rush you through a whole bunch of stuff because they're just taking pictures of photos that are going to be on mantelpieces and so Robin and I had to go racing off to a church and you know be dressed up so we looked like we were coming out having got married you know all those things yeah they even filmed a scene where my little brother played me as a young as a younger child actually it got cut out of the movie too but yeah but they all kind of you know those things always those things always seem to happen as sort of second unit afterthought. So you race through them and you 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 barely remember. Um, it's the old story, isn't it? Is that you know it's very much the through the looking glass tale, isn't it? You so you have the bookends, which is you know reality, which is the beginning and the end. You know you start off and then you know, the story takes off and you know towards the end of the first act you're off and then you come back at the end of the third act and uh, the world is rebalanced again. Um, and uh, so I don't know, I think, I think um, oddly enough, I could be wrong, but I think almost everything that we shot, especially the beginning, is in there. And I was quite surprised because I thought the beginning go, is quite long and it was really lovely to see that they had kept that much in because they, I think what they really needed to do was to set up the, the family and the strength of the family and also set Peter up um, as someone who needs to learn a lesson and to set the kids up as well. And so there were these wonderful sequences we did where we really did improv. And Charlie, I just remember that great scene on the airplane mm. uh, where you and Robin just riffed. And, you know, it's this little airplane scene and there was hardly any dialogue and you and Robin just riffed and we all riffed. And, you know, so much of that dialogue just stayed in there. And the same with us arriving um, in London and all of that had been written in a rather formal kind of James Barry way and we were all allowed to kind of play with it and enliven it and make it more contemporary and I think also help set the tone for the film with a certain amount of comedy but also sort of an Englishness um, that allowed it to then take off and go where it went. Well, Stephen was uh, was very respectful as a director uh, in, in, in my memory uh, of, of his performers. I mean, uh, you know, some directors, especially with kids, will, you know, give you line readings and things like that, if you know, how, how, how you want, what they want you to read, uh, read the line. And he would almost never do that with me. You know, sometimes he would say, well, you know, I'm going for something like this, but of course, you know, a lot better than I can do it. That's <laughs> the kind of thing, uh, uh, the kind of thing he would say. Uh, I, I remember the, the the biggest discussions with him were in in respect to the uh, with respect to the clock smashing scene, uh, where uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman has me you know uh, taking out my uh, bitterness on my uh, uh, towards my father on these uh, on these clocks and watches, uh, and uh, that uh, he really talked through sort of his own own experiences with his family and talked uh, talked through it with me about you know what my character was feeling. Uh, and I think he really liked how that scene came out. And then, then throughout the rest of the uh, the filming, he would he would harken back to that and say, I, I, "I want you to give me give me as much as you you gave us uh, in that uh, in that clock smashing scene." Uh, but uh, but he was very 
respectful of the performers and, and their performances and, and what they were bringing uh, bringing to it. He didn't uh, he didn't try to force it uh, with me or with anybody else. Did you guys um, exchange gifts with one another? I... Oh, I got a beautiful, um, and perhaps you did too, Charlie. I got absolutely beautiful um, etching, I suppose you can call it, or a, a, well, an original drawing by an artist who had done some Peter Pan books. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, the name just, Haig, I think was his last name. Um, but anyway, it was one of the most recent and it was the be- it was the, one of the three kids uh, starting to fly. Um, he gave me that, that was lovely. I, I actually wrote a kind of, you know, riftle, upple poem and uh, gave a copy to everybody. Um, and- I, get, uh, I, got a, I got a Maserati. You got a Maserati? Didn't you? No, no, I didn't. What I did get, what I did get. In fact, I'm looking at it right now, sitting uh, sitting in my house. Uh, is uh, Stephen gave me a telescope? You got a telescope? How cool! Yeah. I can't remember what I uh, do. Um, I got something. I think I got a book from Stephen. Something beautiful. Uh, oh, of course, that's what I got. I got uh, yeah, and I got an original uh, first edition. Of J.M. Barry's um, Peter Pan and Wendy. Yep. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I just I just I've had the telescope uh, sort of in storage here, and uh, my my daughter turned seven uh, this uh, this spring, and I got it out this summer, and we've uh, used it for the first time in a long time. Oh, how cool! How lovely. Well, oh, it's interesting, that's... actually. I mean, it's something I always thought is that you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can never enjoy a movie you were in the way someone else someone else can because every scene you see, obviously you remember when it was filmed and you're thinking about what you could have done differently and every uh, uh, everything else. But you couldn't be much better than Charlie Cosmo. You you oh, were stop. quite you were amazing in that film because you know what you you kind of had to carry it. Uh, you know, you and Robin had to carry that film. Um, and uh, you really, really do. And um, you know, I take my hat off to you. Um, it's a remarkable performance, and it moves me every time. But you're also so damn funny, <laughs> and you just also. And it was a little bit you. You had it naturally. You were so cheeky. Um, but the ability for, uh, you know, child actor. I hesitate to say the word because you were twelve. Uh, so you really knew what you were doing, and I think that's the difference. Um, was that Stephen really could direct you like an adult, um, and you were so open and had such a facility to be able to give him what he wanted, and also to be able to, you know, to, to touch your emotional world very, very easily. Um, and you know that is a rare gift um, uh, for anyone, uh, let alone a twelve-year-old boy. Um, and also the fact that you weren't remotely phased by the, the guys around you, because if you think about it, it was kind of you know amazing group of people that we had. It uh, really was. Well, I mean, thank thank you for all those kind words. <laughs> Thanks, but uh, I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, it, I think that was actually the biggest thing I ever took away from my 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 acting career, which I would say I didn't continue as an adult, but. Uh, uh, you know these people that are sort of mythologized, like Stephen, like Robin, like Dustin. Uh, uh, when you work with, to get to work with them uh, as a kid, when you're not sort of naturally overawed by them the way you might be if you met them as an adult, uh, mm. you get you get to really experience them as people. And it's a, it's a reminder that, that I carry throughout life that you know whoever you're dealing with is uh, it, it, it's just another person like you. That's so true. And what made you just because I know you went to MIT and you know I think. I think there was this whole thing about, you know, I think you were already doing like college level mathematics anyway in your free time when you were, you know, shooting Hook. What made you decide that it wasn't for you? Well, you know, I mean, frankly, looking back, I mean, I I, I got out, I probably got out about a year before I would have been forced out anyway when my voice changed and everything else. But, uh, uh, but I get to say I left on my own terms, so that's nice. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was back home in Minnesota. Where my family had never moved out to Los Angeles. Uh, I had uh, two brothers and a, and a step family. Uh, and, you know, once I was back in town for, for a while and I was, hadn't been in school for three or four years, and I, I started to realize, you know, I don't have any friends my own age. 
Uh, I don't have any sort of new experiences of normal life for the past uh, four years, and, and you can't get that being in town, you know, three months at a time. You, you're either going to go to high school or you're not. Yeah. Uh, and I, I decided I wanted to go to high school, and then I'd, I'd think about uh, whether I wanted to try to get back into movies uh, as an adult or not, and it just uh, just never never really came up again. Wow. But did you, I mean, what was the reaction to the kids at school when it came out with you? Well, the good thing was it was, I had been at the same school since second grade. So mm -hmm. the, the kids I came back to in eighth grade were the same kids I had been in school from second through fifth grade with. Uh, so they already knew me. And I'd say for about two weeks, there was some novelty factor to having, uh, you know, having this child actor come back. Uh, but uh, and my brothers were both in the same school, too. So I knew all of their friends and they all knew me. Uh, and, you know, by by a month or so in, uh, all it was was a good icebreaker. And uh, so then what did you do? You went to MIT, didn't you? Yeah, I went to uh, went, I studied physics, got a degree in physics. Wow. Uh, and uh, then after that, I moved to Washington and worked uh, in Washington for a few years. Uh, doing, I started in a, more or less a science job, but uh, sort of transitioned into more policy work, and uh, then, then went back to law school. And uh, now I'm a law professor. So there you go. Why goodness? Where are you a law professor? Uh, at Case Western in uh, in Cleveland. <laughs> and Carol, I, a lot of other people kind of recognize you from the Princess Diaries. That was fun. Yeah, I got lucky in that. Um, you know, there's certain kind of seminal films, and you don't really know if they're going to be huge hits. Although I have to say, those three or four big movies that I did that have become kind of iconic um, and that people would love it. But yeah, that's been fun because Hook has been, yeah, a nice icebreaker in many ways for people of all generations. And certainly kind of boys love Hook, you know, because they love Charlie, they love Rufio, the Lost Boys, all of that. And the girls, of course, all adore Princess Diaries. So, um, you know, my daughter, and son actually had quite an easy life, I think, growing up because, you know, they'd have a play date or something and, you know, be mom would be, oh my God, you know, so if it's either Princess Diaries or Hook, um, you know, that's the other thing is you always have to be extra nice because, of course, if you are, you know, everyone's ideal mother in two of those sort of iconic films, um, then, you know, the idea of you ever screaming at your child or telling them off or anything like that is just a no-no. Yeah, they're, um, just, they're just hoping you'll be a jerk in real life, right? Yeah, they're just assuming that you're wonderful always uh, <laughs> and uh, get rudely, rudely awakened. And, of course, the other one is, oh, my God, could you please come to my birthday party? And we'd just so love it if you could do that whole thing with the balloons and paint. And I bet you've done that for Gemma. You know, the whole thing with the uh, balloons and the um, darts. Um, and I actually said, look, you know what? That took someone two days to fill all those balloons with paint. Oh, and wow. still the messiest things. And there's absolutely no way that anyone is ever going to do it on my watch. <laughs> but it just, you know, it's, it's like one of the most fun mom things to do. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, those two especially. And then, you know, things like Cliffhanger, uh, kind of more for, you know, kind of the people who really like those big action franchises and Disclosure and things like that. Um, but, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, the 90s was the golden age of filmmaking. And then we, you know, everything went digital. And now we're in the golden age of television, which is kind of sad because everything's so, you know, it's just different. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why these films have such... Uh, people love them so much is because I just remember when I saw Hook again on the big screen, the work that had gone into it, the incredible amount of detail. Uh, and I remember, you know, when you can do those films, you can spend two or three days on one scene. So that's coverage that you, and setups and all those technical things that the audience often aren't aware of, but that's what makes, that's what gives something a rich, tapestry enormously rich feel you go why does this just feel good why did and it's partly because every nuance has been covered and thought about and 
in what we do now is, you know, it's like, you know, a couple of kind of shaky cams and off we go. And it's just so sad that there's a paucity of what I can only call technical, real technical expertise at the expense of technology, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's, uh, it, it, it would be hard to imagine how much craft goes into every every setup uh, on a movie like Hook. It's uh, uh, an amazing undertaking. Yeah, it really did. They really were real they were life-size they were enormous they were fun you could get lost in them i mean the ship was something else um although i know that stephen had a few issues with the ship because um john had built it so brilliantly but he had forgotten kind of that the sides should perhaps be open so you know and it was like you know what do you mean we can't actually just sort of open the side or take it off and then shoot from there and there but that's one of the reasons why a lot of it was shot kind of lengthways uh, or from above um, but uh, you know that's just one of those things yeah, I remember spending a tremendous amount of time below decks with uh, with with Dustin and the wardrobe department because we both <laughs> had these cool suits underneath our pirate suits that they would run cold water through and so we'd sit we'd sit under there and he would you know he would stay sort of half in character as a you know, he must he must get out of this business while you still can young boy <laughs> uh, so he, he was relentless and i think he was serious by the end, by the end. Say, get out while you still can so. just say to a 12 year old get out of this business <laughs> that's right get escape while you still can <laughs> fantasy film of all time <laughs> Well, I have a fun little game for you guys. It's called This or That, but the Pixie Dust edition of the game. So, first, my first question is, mermaids or pirates? Well, my daughter would kill me if I didn't choose mermaids, so I'm going mermaids. You're going mermaids. Okay, I'm going pirates. Captain Hook's pirate ship or the land of the lost boys? Pirate ship. Oh, definitely pirate ship. The pan sword or Tootles marbles? Mm. Pan sword. Marbles. Wendy or Tinkerbell? Wendy. Got to oh, be Wendy. Yeah. It has to be Wendy. Yes. <laughs> and the final one, food fight or sword fight? Oh, I say, I, I go sword fight easily. Oh, food fight. Actually, <laughs> seeing that again and actually talking to the guys who did the Lost Boys, that food fight was fabulous. Well, I remember making the sword fight and uh, uh, they had one in the original shot, shot list. They were going to do the old gag of uh, someone swishing their sword over some candles and putting out the candles. And mm-hmm. Stephen was saying, this, we've, we've seen this a hundred times. So that he came up with the idea that they'd swish their sword over the candles and it would turn the candles on. Uh, like uh, Caroline was saying, it takes two days to set up for this uh, little throwaway gag in the uh, uh, in the movie. But they, they spent hours setting it up so that the sword would whoosh over and light the candles. Yeah, the other one was the leaf landing on my shoulder. And if you the look leaf. at it, you still see yes. the leaf. Do you remember that day? Because you had to wait. Um, to yeah, they did a... something like 63 takes of that leaf. 63 takes. I was fast asleep in the chair by the time they did that. Because what they'd done is that I think they'd already shot the scene with you, with me, with the thingy on it. And they just couldn't get the leaf to land in the correct position. And it was hilarious because, of course, it was all done properly. Uh, you couldn't CGI this stuff. And there, I just remember this great big sparks or whatever it was, you know, with a leaf hanging off a fishing line. And, you know, he had a, you know, a really nice kind of beer gut and he was just towing over and then laying the leaf on my shoulder with the fishing line. And every time it was wrong to the point that Stephen just got so upset. And then he decided it was funny and he called the other set that was shooting at the time, which was Bugsy, um, with uh, Warren Beatty and said to uh, the director, Barry Levinson, um, so how's it going over there? And Barry Levinson said, oh my God, I, I think I'm on my 30th take of Warren trying to pick up a telephone. <laughs> so Stephen said, oh, well, we're over here. I think we're beating you. And then they kind of, t- they, they called each other every so often, kind of turned it into um, some kind of marathon to see who would win or and who would lose. But I think you're right. I think it was 52. And then finally, Stephen said, this is costing way too much money. This is ridiculous. And of course, two years later, they do the stupid feather in Forrest Gump with CGI, right? 
Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the show. I wish we could talk more, but I know you guys are so busy. But my last question. I'm on sabbatical. I'm not busy. <laughs> but my last question is if you could use one word to describe your experience appearing and being a part of the Hook family, what word would that be? Bangarang. <laughs> <laughs> well, how can you tap that? I'll, I'll go bang rang too. <laughs>